everybody and welcome back to our lecture series. I'm Ted, your host, and for this lecture we're going to uh, conduct an analysis. We're going to look back on the 1920s. Um, and to begin with, I'd just like to do a customary recap on what we discussed in our last lecture. So in our last lecture, we looked at the uh, Supreme Court in the 1920s. We looked at the tax court. Um, and, we, and in particular, we looked at uh, the, um, the legal doctrine of incorporation, which continued to reverberate uh, with us um, in the present. Uh, and incorporation is simply um, incorporating the Bill of Rights into the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment um, as a way to ensure that the, uh, the, the that federal laws and state laws uh, are both held to measure to respect um, with the, uh, to, to respect the, the, um, uh, the Bill of Rights to, to inspect those individual liberties and those individual freedoms. Um, we also looked at the uh, the case of Mayor v. Nebraska, uh, and that was an interesting case in which a in a fit of anti-German war hysteria, the Nebraska state legislature um, passed the law outlawing the teaching of of, uh, of of students in the state of Nebraska outlawing the teaching of them in any uh, language other than English. Um, uh, it, the, the the act was um, challenged uh, by a group of German by we can say at least one German uh, teacher um, mayor who uh, lost his case at the state level um, but won at the federal level and uh, it was it was really noticeable because one of the most conservative justices during this era uh, James McReynolds wrote the decision um, in, uh, in in the in the mayor case. And of course, we also had looked at William Howard Taft, the um, larger-than-life figure who sort of dominated the uh, the 1920s. Uh, he sat as chief justice between 1921 and 1930, uh, and, and really tried his best to shape the court in his image, much the same way John Marshall had shaped the court in his image during his tenure as chief justice. Uh, and with that being said, I'd like to jump right into our lecture for today and begin our analysis of the 1920s. Now, as we have seen, the 1920s uh, has the reputation of being an era in which the United States cut loose and engaged in new recreational pastimes when people sought to relax and have a good time on a scale unseen before in American history. This era was also uh, this era also has the distinction of being an age in which the standard of living rose for every American, where home ownership rates skyrocketed, and everyone's life was uh, was an easy one. Uh, everyone was um, was uh, receiving the benefits of these technological breakthroughs, these new marvels like the refrigerator, the vacuum cleaner, the radio. Um, this also had the era. Uh, this, this, this is also seen at the era in which the United States returned to an isolationist policy, uh, particularly in regards to foreign policy, stepping away from global affairs. Now, the 1920s were far more complex and revolutionary than that. Uh, the 1920s also saw an expansion of the, pol of the policies and social attitudes of the progressive era, setting the stage for the contemporary republic and much more. Uh, during the 1920s, the main factor for everything was the major economic revolution taking place, uh, rooted in the rooted in the consolidation and improving methods of efficiency by way of scientific management. Uh, scientific management. Uh, this new uh, method, spearheaded by Frederick Taylor, uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor, led to a magnificent growth in productivity, per capita output, production national corporations um, really uh, national corporations emerged um, uh, the, the corporations that we uh, know today such as um, such as uh, Bank of America for example really emerged during this time period uh, and the business uh, this business growth was accompanied uh, by a significant shift in industry away from the production of heavy industry um, Heavy industry have really dominated uh, American um, uh, industry, the American manufacturing from the 1870s to the 1890s. Uh, but now consumer goods began to uh, replace heavy industry. 
Uh, this was largely the result of electricity now being available for use in homes. The availability of electricity led to a gold rush in products that sought to capitalize on the household goods that could be operated with using it with the uh, use of electricity. Um, consumer goods introduced in this uh, in this period include the aforementioned vacuum cleaner, the toaster, uh, the clothes washer and dryer, um, and, and of course this had the result of easing the burden of uh, household chores, household duties, but also mechanizing housework. Um, equally important in the 1920s with the automobile. Um, now the automobile was not a new invention, however Henry Ford had made it a, con a consumer item available for every social class. Uh, he cut off um, the, uh, the Ford automobile. Um, he, uh, he did that um, and, and he used assembly lines in conjunction with new management philosophies to reduce the price by more than two thirds. Uh, the, price fell, um, the price fell from $950 to $200. That made it more um, affordable to not only the wealthy but the working class. Uh, Ford also took the step of paying his employees the then unheard of sum of five dollars a day, uh, and this allowed him to retain workers, but also allowed his workers to become consumers of the products they were making and to eliminate the intrusion of unions into his factories. Now, Ford is cited had the pioneer of what became known as capitalist welfare. Uh, and capitalist well, uh, welfare really just uh, um, is a term used uh, to describe a set of employee benefits uh, like employee uh, profit sharing plans, pensions and uh, health benefits um, and, and other such tools used to combat unionization. And this was a far cry from looking back and sort of emulating the, uh, the policies of the, of the uh, 19th century. Now, as a result of, the, of this uh, automobile production and ownership went through the roofs, just as with the use of electricity, the automobile had a ripple effect on the economy. Uh, the steel industry, rubber industry, gas industry, oil industry, and electronic industry all benefited from, uh, from automobile, from automobile construction. They all needed to make automobiles and to have them function. Um, but there was also an indirect impact on the Republic, namely the development of highways. Uh, the concrete industry benefited from this, uh, the restaurant industry benefited, and a new industry rose, the roadside or motor hotel, will be now called the motel. Um, the gas station developed as the automobile became the nexus or focal point of the national economy. Um, life was fundamentally altered. Um, when a, a new cultural development, the um, uh, this new cultural development, the automobile soon became an institution in and of itself. With the rise of the automobile, the new products um, and a and a new growth in advertising came about. Has the has the producers of these new consumer goods on the. Uh, Hit, hit the market, um, they had to compete with one another and they had to convince uh, potential customers to buy their products and not their, their rivals. Advertising, again, was not new. Um, Albert Singer pretty much perfected advertising that was, uh, that was being used in the 1890s, early 20th century. Uh, he had perfected that back in the mid 19th century. Um, not much had changed. Um, Carnegie, uh, Rockefeller, Stan, um, Rockefeller for Standard All Day, they all pretty much did the exact same thing. But in the 1920s, there were so many products, so many new products, so many competing products that the advertising industry was massively expanded to meet the needs, the rising demand of all these industrialists. Um, this shift also included a change from industrialists informing the public at large of their goods to playing on the needs and desires like popularity, attraction, and acceptance. Uh, General Motors, when they began to compete with Ford, introduced uh, brands of their automobiles in different, uh, 
in different classes and different purposes uh, and, and, and it most importantly in different colors uh, and this was all done because Ford famously only had the one brand the Model T and it could only be bought in one color black um, this explosion in advertising quickly uh, had him change his production methods and he uh, he also inspired Bruce Barton um, to write the other uh, book nobody knows in 1925 um, in, in the book Barton describes Jesus of Nazareth as the world's greatest advertiser and businessman of all time uh, Barton wrote that Jesus of Nazareth life was a business uh, has that very um, has, has that uh, every businessman should study Jesus' life um, he, uh, he, he wrote that everyone should study his parables uh, and an exercise of learning business language in addition to the elegance of power contained within them. Um, and he pointed, he pointed to one fact. Um, well, at least one, uh, one, one sort of um, uh, takeaway from Jesus' parables. And that is that he took 12 men from the bottom ranks of society and forced the greatest corporation in the history of the world. Now the radio. The radio was uh, another big, um, big item draw, big new consumer good. During the 1920s, installment buying or layaway also rose in prominence, and this was instituted uh, so that the middle and lower classes could more readily purchase uh, the flood of new goods that were hitting the market. This was accompanied by the increasing urbanization of the Republic in the 1920s, and for the first time, urban dwellers now began to outnumber rural dwellers. Uh, this, um, this led to new and expanded markets and greater industrial greater industrial concentration. Um, and, and this was needed. This, this was needed to produce uh, all those goods. Um, a, a national urban culture rose in the wake of this phenomenon. Um, and uh, sports um, now to uh, to spread this urban culture, the motion uh, picture uh, industry and the radio industry developed, uh, creating new national heroes and spectator sports. There's really sports that developed into this juggernaut during this time, um, and, and there was no better relationship uh, than between that of professional baseball and the radio. Now, professional and college, college athletics, they, they, they both rose at this time to become uh, main draws, but none more so to professional baseball. Uh, the, Merrill, um, the, uh, Nat, the, the Major League uh, Baseball, uh, Major League Baseball had uh, just survived a terrible scandal involving the World Series in 1919. Um, uh, it was alleged that the uh, that the Chicago White Sox had um, had conspired uh, during the series, uh, and they became known as the Black Sox, and the entire scandal was known as the Black Sox scandal. Um, Major League Baseball would reform itself and go on to become the national pastime um, of the Republic due to the popularity of uh, well-known players such as uh, Herman Babe Ruth. Um, the the radio the radio really enabled baseball to develop a following. If you've if you've ever been to a baseball game, it's uh it's, it's a whole lot of sitting around. Uh, it, it's not really that exciting that uh that dynamic. But when you listen to the games on radio, they are that much more compelling. Everything is more anticipated. Um, there's just uh, further excitement, further drawing in when you listen to these games on the radio. And that's what the radio allowed, that's what the radio allowed for, that's what the radio allowed to happen. Um, motion pictures, motion pictures as I stated came into being. Um, five, uh, ne nearly five, six of the Republic population began attending at least one showing of a motion picture a week during the 1920s and and this is uh, compared to about half of the population that will attend church service during this same time period um, motion pictures uh, 
motion pictures would uh, will be exported overseas and they would uh, begin to play a very vital role in shaping the global perception of the United States. Um, the first movie stars, uh, the first movie stars, the movie stars that we know them today. Uh, excuse me. Um, movie stars that we know them today really came about during this period. Uh, Rudolph Valentino. Uh, Rudolph Valentino perhaps is like the, the most well known and uh, uh, the biggest star of, of this era. And he created uh, a national. Um, uh, a national hysteria when he uh, uh, passed away tragically at the age of 35. Uh, Charles Lindbergh. Charles Lindbergh was another um, uh, person who uh, who accomplished just a, a monumental um, uh, accomplishment during the, uh, the during the 20s. He became a major star, a major national figure. Um, and, and Lindbergh, of course, gained his fame for his solo flight across the Atlantic Ocean. Now. Lindbergh was not the first to make a solo transatlantic flight. Uh, in 1919, a flight was made from Newfoundland to Ireland, but Lindbergh became the symbol of uh, man triumphing over nature and uh, the master of these new machines. So he was able to capitalize on his flight in a different way, not being the first, but being just sort of like the, the mascot, the, uh, the official public figure of this new movement. And though the era is known for its uh, economic prosperity, it was not felt by everybody. The agricultural industry suffered severely during this time, uh, have wartime demands receded, and as overseas uh, nations were able to recover their domestic food production. The boom uh, was fed by government assistance to help business, um, business prosperity. Uh, and this was... Um, this was uh, done uh, also to help businesses find new global markets because again, uh, so much was being produced that it could not be uh, consumed domestically alone. Um, foreign markets had to be exploited for, for, uh, for the boom, for the, for the good time to continue. Um, now domestically, the Republican Party returned to dominate national politics as it had done before the Civil War. Uh, they were the majority party nationally uh, with the exception of the southeastern states, um, the former slave states. Um, they, uh, and really this was just a continuation from the 19th century. This was a continuation from uh, the Civil War. Uh, Wilson's presidency was the result of a split. Uh, remember back uh, to the election of 1912. Um, there was a split in the Republican Party between the uh, supporters of William Howard Taft and Theodore Roosevelt in 1912. Uh, the three presidents who sat in office at the time during the, during the 1920s, Warren Harding, Calvin Coolidge, and uh, Herbert Hoover, are generally considered highly conservative. Um, they are noted uh, for stigmas associated with their administrations, Harding for the Teapot Dome, uh, Coolidge for allowing conditions to spiral out of control and Hoover for failing to act uh, after the economic collapse of 1929. Uh, their reputations are, however, uh, especially in the case of Hoover, uh, un unwarranted and really distort their historical accomplishment. Uh, and all three, all three administrations uh, supported and affirmed the the recent experience of the government business cooperation to foster an alternative uh, to regulation. And we'll break here and we'll come back with part two of our analysis of, uh, of the 1920s. And as always, I'm Ted. Hit like, subscribe, and comment, and let me know what you thought about this lecture.